Today, we are beginning an exciting book, and I'll tell you all about it in just a moment. Read it for us. Jordan. John 1, 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. You may be seated. Wow. Can't believe that I'm uh, back up in the pulpit, and there are people actually out here. And I don't know if you've been watching the, the uh, sermons online this week, but Katie has been my only congregate that I've been preaching to, and I don't know that she's been enjoying it that much, because, uh, I mean, I have been accused all my ministry by various people who say, while you were preaching today, you were staring at me. You, you were aiming that sermon at me because you kept looking at me. And most, if not every time, anyone has said that. It's not true. I didn't know I was looking at them. And, uh, but anyhow, Katie could say it's true because every sermon I preached for almost the last three months, I've been looking right at her. I told you that since she was the only one when I used the word beloved, she blushed. <laughs> All right, today I'm going to begin a verse by verse presentation of the Gospel of John. Folks, this book is my favorite book in the entire Bible. In my nearly 40 years of ministry, I preached through this book more than any other. In fact, I preached through it verse by verse a total of four times. Four times. This will be the fifth. I preached through it in my pastorate in Baton Rouge, in New Orleans, in St. Louis. And it was the very first book I covered when I became pastor here almost 24 years ago. And so this will be my fifth time, but it's been 24 years since I have done it. Therefore, I'm eager to do so again. I love, I love the Gospel of John. I've read it personally more than any other book of the Bible. I'm more familiar with the Gospel of John than any other book of the Bible. Every congregation needs their pastor to take them through this book one verse at a time. And if for some strange and unforeseen reason I were to wind up pastoring another church someday, this would be the very first book that I would begin in that new pastorate. John's Gospel is the book that I have always recommended that new Christians read as they begin their spiritual journey. Always. And for any Christian who might be wrestling with doubts about his faith, I encourage him to read this gospel. I also encourage unbelievers, unbelievers to read it. Those who might be searching for God. They need to read every chapter and verse of it. This book is packed with amazing information. Information that every person needs to know. It's the book that will persuade you to become a Christian. It will. And after reading it, if you're still unconvinced of the identity of Jesus of Nazareth, then there's nothing else I know to recommend. Really. Now, before covering verses 1 to 5, let me give you some introductory information. You need this. Remember, that is what you always do before reading a book. You have to ascertain certain information. Who is the author? Well, John, the apostle, is the author. He's one of the 12 apostles. His father was Zebedee. His mother was Salome or Salome. Some people pronounce it Salome. 
John had an older brother by the name of James. The two of them were called the sons of thunder. They were so protective of Jesus that one day they called down fire from heaven. Well, they asked God to break down fire from heaven upon the Samaritans. He didn't do it, but they wanted that done because the Samaritans had disrespected Jesus. This is the same James and John whose mother tried to get them special seats of honor in the coming kingdom. But because John lived a long, long life, probably into his 90s, we know that over time he mellowed out, he calmed down. And instead of being a son of thunder, he became known as the apostle of love. And you'll see why. As we go through this book, I think he mentions the word love about 80 times, 80 times. Now, John doesn't identify himself as the author from this gospel. It's church history who tells us the name of the author. I think it's interesting to know that the writer identifies himself within the book as the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, it's more than interesting to me. I think it's kind of strange that John would identify himself this way. It'd be like one of you telling someone, I'm a member of Live Oak Community Church, and I'm the member that Ken loves. <laughs> really? Th that would raise some eyebrows, unless it was my wife, Kathy, I guess. All we can conclude is that John, by claiming that title, he, he must have felt overwhelmed. He must have been sort of starstruck beyond himself that Jesus would love him at all. Love him at all. You see, John knew that he was a rotten sinner, saved by God's grace. And so he was just thrilled with the fact that the God of the universe actually loved him personally. My mother and I were very, very close. And that's why I was always called a mama's boy. That didn't mean at all that my mother loved me more than my other siblings. So I think... John's expression was similar to mine. It was sort of like him saying, I'm a Jesus' boy. I think that's what he meant by saying, I'm the disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, John didn't just write this gospel bearing his name. He also wrote the three epistles of John that we just recently went through. He also authored the book of the Revelation. This means he wrote five books in all. As to when it was written, some think that it would have been written prior to the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. But most scholars would say it was written sometime between 85 and 90 AD. About the same time he would have penned his three epistles. And as for the purpose of the book's writing, very, very easy to determine. John tells us why he wrote this book. Look in chapter 20, verse 31, he says, these words are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Messiah and that believing you might have life in his name. It was important to John that everyone know who this person, Jesus, was. He was God in human flesh. He was fully God. He was fully man. He was not half God and half man. He was fully God. He was fully man. The eternal God himself had become human. That was John's message. The creator had become a part of his creation. And why? 
in order that he might save sinners from their sin, from death, from judgment, and from hell. John wanted everyone to know who this person was. And he was presenting it not only to strengthen the faith of the up and coming second century believers, but to combat and straighten out the false teachers who were saying that Jesus was not God at all. He couldn't be, they said, because human flesh was evil. Well, not John. John knew who Jesus was. He had spent years with him. He was also the first cousin of Jesus. So we have covered everything we need to know about. No, John the Baptist was the first cousin of Jesus. Scratch that. Scratch that, okay? We've covered everything we know before reading the book. We need to know who wrote it, John. We need to know when he wrote it, 85 to 90 AD, why he wrote it to present Jesus' identity so people could have eternal life. And we know to whom he wrote it. It wasn't written to a specific person or a specific group of people. The Gospel of John was written to everyone. To everyone. And I guess the only other thing we would want to know beforehand is what type genre is the writing? In other words, is it history like the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible or the book of Acts? No. Is it uh, an epistle such as the book of Jude that we just finished? Is it apocalyptic such as Daniel and Revelation? Is it wisdom literature like Proverbs? like Psalms, like Ecclesiastes? Or is it prophecy, such as the book of Jeremiah or Isaiah? It's none of those. It's a gospel. It's a gospel. There are four gospels in the Bible. The word gospel means good news. This book is the good news about Jesus Christ. All four of them are about Jesus. And let me tell you this, and then we'll take a look at verses 1 to 5. John is different from the other three Gospels. In fact, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're referred to, and you probably know this, they're referred, referred to as the synoptic Gospels. And that's because they are so similar. Matthew, Mark, and Luke cover much of the same material. The same stories. But John... The Gospel of John is different. He covers a lot of things concerning Jesus that the other three do not mention. For example, and we're about to see this, Matthew and Luke introduce Jesus from the time of His birth. We know the Christmas story. John introduces Him from the beginning. Before creation itself. Matthew Mark and Luke give us the earthly history of Jesus. They cover the birth and the life and the experiences and the teachings and the parables, including his arrest, his crucifixion, his resurrection. But John doesn't focus on the earthly story. John gives us the heavenly story. 90% of what is in John is not mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and and Luke. There's nothing in John's gospel about the birth of Christ or the early life of Christ. John doesn't focus on the history of the Lord's life. There are no parables in John because parables are earthly stories. This is a heavenly book. Whereas Matthew presents Jesus as a king, and that's the reason you have this long genealogy. And Mark presents him as a servant. You have no genealogy. Servants, their genealogy is not important. And whereas Luke focuses on the fact that he is a man, 
the Son of Man. John presents to his readers that Jesus is God Himself in human flesh. And folks, this would have gotten the attention of his readers would have. My buddy John Tyler told me recently this retired attorney who knows like a dozen languages, maybe not that many, and making him uncomfortable, but he told me this one day. He said for the first time in his life, he is understanding the Bible. Well, buddy, hang on. You're really going to love this one, okay? You're all going to love it. You're going to learn some stuff. In fact, this is going to be one of the most interesting Bible studies you have ever experienced in your entire life. Not because of the teacher, but because of the content. So, let's get started. Ready? Let's get started. Look at verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. There is so much there. There's so much there. When we go to the beginning, we're talking before Genesis 1.1. As you know, Genesis 1, 1 says, in the beginning, God created. Well, John says, in the beginning of the beginning, before the creation, was the Word. Wherever the beginning was, the Word was there. And the Word, folks, is none other than Jesus Himself. You'll see this as we go through it. Jesus is called the Word three times here in verse 1. He's called the Word again. I think down in verse 14. Now you're probably wondering, if John is referring to Jesus, why didn't he just say, in the beginning was Jesus? Right? In the beginning was Jesus. Well, his point of the whole book, remember, is to convey, convey Jesus as God. But he chose the Word here to identify Him as the Word. That was a clever term that he purposely used because of the audience of that day. You see, John's audience of readers at that time would have been Greeks and they would have been Jews. And the Greeks were very, very philosophical. You know this from your own study of history. The Greeks already had an understanding of the word. Their term was, the Greek term is logos, by the way, which means word. And this word to them, to the Greeks, and that's what they referred to it as, was a reference to the reality that was visible in creation. They believed in a Logos spirit. It was a non-personal power source, if you will. The Greeks believed the Logos was this non-personal force that was just kind of floating around the universe. You see, they believed that you couldn't have creation without a power source of some kind. The philosophers believed this non-personal force was responsible for every, literally everything in existence. Well, John steps up. John the Apostle steps up and he says, let me introduce you to this non-personal force that you call a Logos spirit. And by the way, He is personal. He is personal. This Logos, this Word, is very much a personal God who came into this world. This Word is not just a force, not just a concept. This Word 
is a person. And folks, to the Greeks, that would have gotten their attention. Say, what? And then there was the Jewish audience. And as you know, they were very familiar with the ever present phrase, the word of the Lord, right? Throughout the Old Testament, we read that the word of the Lord came to this prophet, to that prophet. Scripture was revealed to them as what? Thus saith the Lord. The Lord spoke this word. The Lord spoke that word. The Jews were always seeking to know what? The word of the Lord. So John says to all these people, Greeks and Jews, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. Furthermore, this word was God. Now, bear with me because John, little by little, begins to give them more information about this word. And then he finally gets around to giving the word a name. As you'll see. But let's move on. He was with God in the beginning. What's John conveying here? He was with God in the beginning. He's conveying that at the beginning of time, the Word was already existing. John is pointing out that this Word was already in existence when God created everything that exists. Now folks, get this. If you're not a part of the creation, you're not a part of time and space. And if you're not a part of time and space, what does that make you? Eternal. And that's a very important statement that he was trying to convey. This word was pre-existent. He existed before the beginning of everything that does exist. He didn't begin with the beginning of life. He was not a part of creation. He was not a created being. You see, time as you and I know it, it began with creation. It began on the first day when God created. And time will continue until guess when? Until we get to heaven. We will live in heaven for eternity without time in the very same manner that God existed prior to creation. God's outside of time and therefore he's eternal. And by the way, you'll see later that Jesus borrows, I guess you could put it that way. He borrows a title for himself that is a title that belongs to to God. Do you remember in Scripture when Moses was told to deliver the people? And he said, when the people ask, who sent me? Who am I to tell them? Send me. Do you remember what he said? God said, you tell them I am sent you. I am. God was saying, my name is eternal being. He speaks of himself in the present continuous tense because there was never a time when he did not exist. And you will see that Jesus throughout the New Testament uses over and over again this same title. Jesus said on one occasion, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. When the Pharisees and the Sadducees wanted to know his identity, he said, I am that I am. Now back to verse 2. I find it interesting that John is repeating here in verse 2, what he said in verse 1. Remember, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. And the Word was God. Verse 2, he says, He was with God in the beginning. Why do we repeat things? 
We repeat them for emphasis. This word was with the eternal God in the beginning. Wherever the beginning was, and that's a tough, tough concept. Wherever the beginning was, God and the word were there as one. Now, I have to point out and explain something else to you before I move on to verses 3 and 5. I hope you are loving this as much as I am. You're not sweating as much as I am, but, but I hope you're enjoying it. Listen to this. As you can easily see, the Word is distinct from the eternal God. Distinct. Folks, it's unmistakable that there is one God and only one God who is revealed in three persons. And, and I think you would have to be, well, stupid is too strong a word. This only word comes to mind. You'd have to be stupid not to see it. The word was with God and yet the word was God. Now, how can you be God and at the same time be with God? I, I mean, how? Does that make sense? Only in a Trinitarian way can this be explained. And that's why the vast majority of Christians believe in the Trinity. It's been taught for 2,000 years. Let me see if I can convey it to you. There is only one God. One. Never, ever, ever envision three gods. That's polytheism. There's only one God, but that one God chose to reveal Himself in three persons. Now, when I say three persons, please do not think of three separate individuals. You can't split up God into three parts. God chooses to reveal Himself as Father, on other occasions as Son, on other occasions as Holy Spirit. He doesn't reveal Himself in three modes as the United Pentecostals believe. That's called modalism. And that was rejected and branded as heresy by the early church fathers nearly 2,000 years ago. Jesus is God. But Jesus is not the Father. Jesus is not the Holy Spirit. Likewise, the Father is not the Son, is not the Holy Spirit. But this one God chooses to reveal Himself in three distinct persons. When Jesus says that He and the Father are one, that does not mean they're the same person. If they were, then Jesus could have easily said, I am the Father. Jesus never said He was the Father. Nowhere at any time does he say that. And nowhere in Scripture can you see the distinct representation of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit any clearer than at the baptism of Jesus. Remember when John was baptizing, not this John, John the Baptist, was baptizing Jesus? A voice from the Father was heard from heaven. The Holy Spirit descended like a dove upon Jesus. Most people have a hard time with the Trinity, but it seems rather clear to me when, when the concept locks in, you understand. And this notion, by the way, that it should be rejected simply because the word Trinity is never used in the Bible is, is ridiculous. I mean, there are many theological truths, many words used to explain theological truths that are not found in the Bible. The word, for example, incarnation is not found in the Bible, yet all churches use it to explain God in human flesh. So it's as simple as this. The one God reveals Himself as Father Sometimes as Son, sometimes as Holy Spirit. Each of these persons, remember not three individuals, this one God distinct in persons, 
means that the Father is not the Son, is not the Holy Spirit. And at the same time, they're not three gods. There's only one God. You, you, you got that? You got that? Wayne, did you have that, buddy? Okay. Let's quickly move to the next verse. Because it's getting late. But I haven't preached to you guys in so long. That's why I'm going on. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that's been made. Not one thing. That's how the little Greek reads. Not one thing exists that He didn't make. Everything that exists, the Word made it. Now you have to understand, John is standing up. He's, he's writing this down, but you can bet he was constantly proclaiming this as well. The Word made it. It all came from Him. Everything came from Him. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were all involved in creation. Look at this. There is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through Him. Now, if Jesus is the creator of everything that's created, then He's uncreated. And therefore, He is the eternal God. And I tell you this, and John was saying this because there were...